Hi, everybody. So, uh, pretty exciting. Um, we talked for five weeks about all the steps that we need to take in order to fabricate our um, screw-retained implant-supported removable prosthesis. And this week, we're going to be talking about the actual finalization of this prosthesis. So we're going to talk about processing and uh, all the aspects associated with that. So hopefully, after we did our trying on the bar, we checked everything, made sure our aesthetics and phonetics are correct, make sure our centric occlusion is correct, make sure, very important this step is, uh, to check if uh, your excursive and protrusive movements are balanced. Because remember, if we have those issues, if in protrusion and lateral intrusion we have some kind of issues, because of the patient not having any kind of proprioception and everything being screwed in right to the bone and being able to produce a lot of force, that's going to cause some issues. So make sure you double check, triple check everything before you do that. So once the case comes back, we are ready to start processing our case. However, before we do that, let me talk to you just a little bit about uh, the process of fabrica fabricating a, um, a drilling guide for our posterior teeth in this case. Remember that I do not put access holes through my posterior teeth or teeth that uh, are sitting right on top of the access holes of the bar. Uh, at least if I have other, at least one or two holes that are right at the gingiva. Because I prefer not to mess with the teeth until everything is processed. That's just my own personal preference. If you choose to go any other route, it's up to you. I like to use this route. However, over the years, I've used different kind of things. I went as far as, and I think we've talked about this, I went as far as making like little jigs that uh, you hook an analog to and a burr. I've used um, uh, a, a milling surveyor. I've developed my own set of uh, burrs actually, like a tapering type of burr, uh, to be able to go through the access hole. But the latest innovation, let's say, that I've been playing with is a creation of a digital uh, drill guide, kind of like a surgical guide, but instead of using it on the bone, I'm using it on a denture. This will allow uh, me the, uh, the ease, I should say, of being able to cut right through the area that I need to cut without having to worry about damaging anything else. Okay, so let's uh, take a few minutes and I'm going to show you guys um, how to get that done, okay? So first things first, what we're going to do is we're going to modify some analogs. And the way I modify them is I take the the very bottom parts of it and I thin them out. And if you look at the video, you can see that the very bottom portion or in the video, very top portion is a little bit more thin, more rounded. And then I will attach those analogs to the denture where, the, where those teeth are that need to be drilled. I just attach them by melting a little bit of wax. Okay, once that is done, I'm going to do my scanning, okay? Uh, the scanning video is a little mm, confusing because I'm showing you that I'm scanning the analog side first and then I'm scanning the tooth side. Uh, in reality, it was actually the other way around. I actually did three scans because I wanted to make sure I have a good analog side scan and a good tooth side scan. So I did three and bound them together. But nevertheless, I'm just getting a little bit off topic and I want to make sure that I kind of show you everything what I did. Okay, so I did that scan, I made sure everything is looking good, and then I imported that into Mesh Mixer, which is a program, free program that I've talked about a little bit, that allows me to fix scans. Because if I import stuff into 3Shape without fixing that scan from my DOF scanner, a lot of times things don't work out too well. So now that I'm in 3Shape, I'm able to design my little drill guide. And I'm using my uh, custom tray module. And I'm simply showing uh, thickness of the um, of the tray to be about two to three millimeters, depending what you want to use. And uh, there's no space for impression material, uh, so you set that at zero. And what I'm basically doing is I'm lining up my uh, holes uh, because in the custom tree module you can choose holes which are going to be four millimeters in diameter by five millimeters in length, and I'm changing the translucency 
of the uh, of the actual guide and actual model and I'm able to position those holes right in line with those analogs and that is precisely why the very tops of those analogs are thinned out so I get a more precise positioning so this is what the guide looks like when it's designed now I've uh, imported the file into my slicing software and I'm just nesting it making sure it's got the right angles to it making sure it's got the right supports and everything else associated with it. Once that is done, I'm going to export that file and print it, as you can see in this video right there. Okay. Once that is done, I use two baths. One with dirty alcohol, one with very clean alcohol. Three minutes each. Once that is done, we're going to dehydrate that at 140 degrees Fahrenheit for about 7-10 minutes. Once that is done, we can go ahead and use our setup to start processing. Okay. So you're going to look at the setup, and oftentimes you have little deficiencies in wax, and uh, and that has to do with the fact that the tissue is not completely even, and that's completely normal. If you have a flat tissue, chances are you're dealing with a model, and I'm not talking the the, the super model that you see in the you know in the catalogs or whatever. Uh, I'm talking about dental model. Um, Natural tissue has some kind of ridges, right? They might be aggressive, they might be minimal. But even with minimal ridges, you're going to have a little bit of discrepancy on the surface of your denture. And I like to uh, try to minimize things as much as possible. So that's why I will take my, um, I'll take my denture, I'll examine it, and I'll look if, and see if there's any issues that are just somewhat minimal. And what I'll do is I'll take my uh, goat hair brush, and on low RPMs, about 5,000, I'll go ahead and try to smooth things out just a little bit. And then I'll go with my hot air gun, that really, really small one, the one I can adjust the heat and the temperature very precisely, and I'll just smooth the wax just slightly, okay? Once that is done, I'm going to be attaching two analogs. Remember, because my back teeth are covered, right? So the bar has Teflon tape in there right now, and there's just... Uh, teeth sitting right on top of it. There's no holes of any kind. So I'm attaching two analogs to the anterior portion only. And you see I'm using these little hemostats to make sure everything's nice and tight, which is not horribly too important at this point. Okay? And the reason for that is because the bar is already fabricated. Okay? Once that is done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour up my processing model. I do not process on my master cast. I take my magnetic ring, I put my Play-Doh or whatever I'm using, I use personally our time dough and I start boxing up my denture making sure that I have everything around it sealed using a little brush to adapt things just so I have a slight overlap okay between the intaglio and the surface of uh, buccal facial okay now I'm just pouring up my type 3 stone I'm not using type 4 stone I don't need type 4 stone I have the rigidity of the bar that's going to hold everything in place. So I need something that I can break apart fairly easily, but at the same time hold the shape. So I'm using regular type 3 stone, making sure I'm just covering all the analogs completely. Once everything is set up, pretty simple. Take apart the ring, take apart the uh, the dough, remove it carefully. You don't want to damage things, you know, don't get too aggressive. As you can see, I'm using a little brush just to kind of brush things away. I don't want to horribly damage my um, wax up because I took a lot of care getting it done okay once the model is clean make sure you trim it so it fits into the flask I've made that mistake before make sure you have enough vertical space also okay so once everything is done go ahead and mix your stone I'm using a regular flasking stone um, this one's type 3 from uh, high-tech dental it's, I think it's called flask stone um, mix it up to proper proportions and uh, do not overfill the bottom just put enough in there so you can nest the uh, the model with the denture nicely on there be aware of the flask itself okay make sure you're not too close to the top make sure your plane of occlusion is as even as possible so you're able to deflask things a little bit easier okay and uh, go ahead and start smoothing things out as soon as the stone gets a little bit harder okay I go a little bit at a time. Usually I kind of leave the stone in there for about five, six minutes, depending on the ambient temperature, obviously. 
And uh, once it starts setting up, I'll just clean up the edges very nicely and even use a little brush to clean things up. Once the stone sets up completely, now you have those long pins in there that we used when we poured out the model. Okay, We're going to replace those long pins with regular screws, but also right on top of the screws, a little bit above them, not right on top of them, just slightly above the bar. We're going to put a couple of burr shanks that have been cut. And you can see that it's just putting right on top of them. You don't want to dig those all the way down. And the reason for that, because you're not going to be able to close your flask. So those are just like position holders for you. Okay. Once all of that is done, what you're going to do is you're going to take some wax and you're going to smooth things out a little bit in that area because you don't want stone flowing in those places and everything else. Um, double check everything. Make sure you got plenty of room. Make sure everything is evened out. And then go ahead and start pouring up your second and third pour. So for the second pour, I'm using a pourable stone um, that's specifically designed for flasking without vibration. I really like using that because it just gives me a really, really good adaptation to the teeth and it really provides uh, good texture. You can also use putty in conjunction with stone. You can use any kind of processing technique that uh, you're comfortable with as long as you're using a proper uh, acrylic. Okay. You have to understand is that these are hybrids and they are um, going to be uh, absorbing a lot of forces. Okay, if you're going to use some cold cure acrylic, make sure the type you're using is going to, is going to be a high impact cold cure acrylic. Because if you're just going to use something that you would use for a flipper or something like this, it's going to fall apart on you. As well as you need to realize this is going to be in the patient's mouth for a long period of time. So you want to make sure you use something that's going to be more stain resistant. In my case, I prefer to use a high-impact acrylic, uh, which I will later on um, cover with glaze. Okay. So once you did your second pour of stone, what I generally do is I'll wait about four or five minutes till the stone starts to thicken, and I'll start uncovering the tops of the teeth. And the reason I do that, it actually helps me deflask things a lot easier. And this technique was used widely uh, when uh, they were still using porcelain teeth. And because I use uh, Ivo, uh, not Ivo Clars, uh, because I'm using Vita uh, Lingua Forms and uh, XL anteriors, they're highly filled ceramic tooth. So that makes it highly wear resistant. However, they're not as um, impact resistant to lateral forces. Okay. So by opening the tops of the teeth, I'm able to, um, to minimize lateral forces on those teeth while deflasking so I don't chip any of them or I don't crack any of them. And that's why it's also important to get uh, things balanced very well uh, before you start processing things and after you start, after you process things both on the articulator and intraorally so you don't create those lateral forces, those chipping uh, opportunities for those teeth. Okay, Because I'm trying to use a harder, uh, harder tooth here for one simple reason. If I'm going to use a softer tooth because the patient is going to be exerting a lot of forces, well, chances are they're going to be exerting a lot of forces. They're going to wear down those teeth fairly quickly. I do not want to do that. I want to make sure it lasts as long as possible. That's why I'm going to use a tooth like that. Okay. So once the second pour sets up, you put your separator on and do your third pour. You can also, if you don't want to wait, what you can also do is during your second pour, after you open up those teeth, go ahead and put a piece of soft, uh, not soft tissue. <laughs> Got a little confused. Uh, tissue paper, something you use uh, on a daily basis, something you have around the house, something you have around the lab. What it's going to do is it's going to absorb some moisture and pretty much become a separator between those two layers. So you don't have to wait for things to dry up or anything else. So put a piece of tissue paper and go ahead and put your third, po uh, third pour right on top of it. Okay. Then I usually wait about 25 minutes to get things done nice and uh, you know the stone sets up and everything else uh, and the thing I do that's a little bit different from most people I do not use a boil out tank what I use is my pressure pot without pressure <laughs> so it's a very interesting system I don't have a well I have a boil out tank but I don't use a boil out tank I'm using a pressure pot but I'm not using it as a pressure pot so it's very confusing so my pressure pot is set to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So that's average temperature to cure acrylics. What I'll do is I'll put my flask or several flasks right into that pressure pot and let it sit there 
depending on the type of wax you're using, you need to adjust the time. But I let it sit there on average between 20 to 25 minutes, depending on the wax I'm using. Once that is done, what I'll do is I'll just basically take them out of the uh, pressure pot without pressure, open it up, and I just use a spatula to scoop the wax out. And if I get the temperatures just right, it oftentimes just peels out as one piece. In this case, it didn't happen. Once I clean the most of the uh, clean most of the wax out, I will uh, use a kettle with boiling water to get rid of the residual wax. And then whatever is left on the teeth, that minimal wax, I'll go ahead and use a, a steamer to get everything cleaned up from that and the bar. Okay. But the bar needs to come off because you got to make sure you got everything cleaned up. You got to make sure everything's prepped. Because if you just leave it on there, it just doesn't really get things perfectly clean. So I take the two screws, I remove the bar, I'll steam clean the bar again, and then I'll look at the tissue. What I mean by look at the tissue, I'll look at the model. So the indentation of the, um, the integral surface of the denture. And if it's got any kind of unevenness there, I'll take my just a scraper and just smooth things out. It's a lot easier than getting these th things done in uh, acrylic. So here I'm just applying my uh, separator with airbrush. I, I like to use an airbrush with my uh, acrylic type separator. It just creates a nice and even coat every time. So I do two coats and uh, then I'll just clean uh, the teeth off with bonomer before doing any kind of bonding. And I check my... Um, Check my bar, make sure everything's looking good. I'll use the two screws again and screw down the bar nice and tight. And you see in the back, there's nothing there. There's no any kind of analogs. It's just sitting on the stone, which is perfectly fine. And what I'm doing here, this is kind of an important step. I'm blocking out the excess holes, but I'm blocking it out with not Teflon tape. I'm using silicone, impression silicone. And the reason I like doing that is because it seals things up fairly nicely. Make sure you use a color that's going to stand out. Like in this case, I'm using blue because it's going to be coming through. The color will be coming through the acrylic fairly easily so I can line things up a lot better. Okay. Once everything's cleaned up, once you're ready to go, I prime my teeth. Because I'm using a highly filled ceramic tooth, I need to use a Viticol or I need to use Palabond, something like that to get the teeth nice and ready to be adhered to the acrylic. And you can see right here, I'm using a Q-tip on top of the teeth. And what I'll use is a small brush to go around the teeth. And the same thing with the bar. I'll use a Q-tip to go on top and I'll use the brush to go underneath the bar because I want to make sure everything is nice and ready and primed. Once that is good to go, I'll mix my acrylic. So the thing to be aware of uh, with Vitacol, you need to make sure that it sits on the teeth for at least five minutes, but not longer than 15. So just adjust your mixing times and everything else to those parameters. Once the teeth are priming and the bar is priming, my acrylic is getting nice and doughy. Okay, just checking everything. And then I'm going to pack my acrylic. Oftentimes, people will do trial packing, and I've done trial packing for years. Uh, with cases like these, I try not to do that because I'm a little worried about moving stuff around when I'm dealing with bars. So I'll just straight down close under press and um, I'll make sure I get it nice and tight. I use actually a rawhide hammer and just kind of push things and, and beat on that a little bit on the side. And usually I get a fairly good closure. And I cure it anywhere between two and nine hours, depending which protocol you're using. Once that is done, I'm going to deflask. Well, obviously once everything's cooled also, I'm going to deflask my denture. So what I'm doing first, as you can see right here, I'm just getting everything out of the flask, but I'm not going to deflask right away. I'm going to take my third pour off just so things are nice and open right there. And I'm actually going to put things in water for about 15, 20 minutes. I want the stone to soak up and get a little bit softer. That makes it for easier separation. Now be careful when you're deflasking things right here because you don't want to be start pulling denture away from the model. You just want to get kind of open this envelope because remember that denture is screwed in there and you don't want to mess up that connection. You don't want to mess up those screws. You don't want to mess up a lot of things. So you see I'm being really careful and just kind of pushing things from the side. That's why I don't ever use hammers. I'm just using an air chisel right here. If you're good with something else, go ahead and use that. But for me, this works fairly well. So you see how this just pops open? And the, there's stone that's a little bit stuck around those pins, the guide pins. 
or the broken down burr shanks or cut down burr shanks. And I'm just going to use my um, walnut shell to clean those uh, those things up a little bit. And then I'm using a hemostat to open up those access holes. Once that is done, I'm going to use a burr, number eight burr. But remember, you have to be careful. So I'm using this about five to 10,000 RPMs to open things up. And I pretty easily can remove the denture from the model. From this point, I'm just looking at things, making sure I'm going to start cleaning things up. So at this point, I'm going to utilize my drill guide that I've made, that I've printed. Now you see I'm using like a little guide sleeve right on top of that, which fits into that four millimeter hole. I just made that myself from tubing that I got at Home Depot. And I'm just lining things up very easily and going in with a uh, scaler. And I'm using loops at this point. You see that light shining through? I like to use loops when I'm doing things like this to open up all four access holes. Once that is done, I'm going to start my polishing procedures. But be careful. You have to understand that you just opened up and those interfaces are out there in the open. So first things first, you want to make sure you clean up those interfaces. And there's a video that's also posted that wasn't done by me, how to use a scalpel to uh, the, uh, the the blunt end of the scalp, a scalpel to um, to clean up acrylic around the interfaces. You can also use burrs that are non-cutting on metal, but cutting on acrylic. Um, they're made out of some type of plastic, actually, to get things cleaned up. Once that is done, you want to protect those interfaces when you're going to be polishing acrylics, when you're going to be cleaning stuff around and doing things like that. Okay, so you see right there, that's exactly what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the same protocol I follow when I'm uh, sandblasting my bars. Okay, I'm going to put the analogs with pins and I'm going to cover the analogs with heat shrink tape. Once I got everything covered, I can start easily working around with my burrs, what kind of burrs I need at that point. You know, usually I'm working with silicone polishers, wheels of some sort, and just getting things smoothed out making sure things line up, making sure things are going well, okay? Once everything is polished up, I will generally just um, uh, pumice things first and then also check and make sure things are fitting nice and well onto the model because, you know, uh, sometimes you have a compression on the soft tissue with wax and then with acrylic, it might not be sitting down all the way. So I check things um, couple of times. Usually I'll check things before I'll start polishing just so the analogs are not in the way. And then I'll just double check things after I polish everything up. Okay. So you see I'm just checking making sure that it's all sitting. I'm going to check my occlusion again, making sure everything closes. Now for this particular case, I haven't processed my upper denture yet. And the reason for that is that um, my upper actually wasn't planned properly. So we ended up doing a, uh, a hybrid on hybrid. So it's got acrylic teeth in the front and on the bicuspids, but the molars are actually zirconia because I didn't have enough room uh, for the acrylic bar, uh, well, for the bar with acrylic teeth, because remember, you need to two millimeters of acrylic all the way around and you need uh, so much room for the tooth. Well, we didn't have that because what apparently happened is that even though we had a surgical guide, something happened during surgery and ingulation uh, was off uh, uh, on the saw that the surgeon was using and they didn't cut, they didn't remove enough bone. So we decided to do a denture that's going to be part acrylic teeth and part zirconia teeth. So here I'm just checking occlusion but my posing is still in wax. So I check everything, make sure my centric stops are good and I'll just, you know, uh, put my analogs back on and just start doing the final polishing. Okay. You can do this step beforehand, but the problem is if something's off on your adaptations, you might have to re-polish re things. So I decide to do it afterwards. Okay, I usually don't do a final polish with hand polishing. I will glaze things. And the reason for that, and I've talked about this a little bit, uh, the hygiene is very important for the patient. And no matter how well you polish acrylic, it's just polished acrylic. When you're using a light cure glaze, in my opinion, you're able to seal those margins a lot better. And it will last anywhere between a year to two years. After about two years, you want to reapply that glaze because it's going to start peeling off. 
what it's going to do is that the glaze is going to reduce the roughness coefficient. Now, in order for plaque biofilm not to adhere to your denture, the roughness coefficient needs to be below 200. Unfortunately, the glaze is not able to get below that point. It's slightly above it, but it's still lower than a polished acrylic. So what it's going to do is going to seal everything. It's going to make sure that the stuff doesn't get stuck to your denture, make it more cleansable, and also a little bit more aesthetic. So here, I'm just holding the denture. Uh, uh, the analogs are still on top of it. I just removed the heat shrink because I want to protect those interfaces. So I'm just holding the denture by the analogs and I'm applying acrylic in a couple of different spots. So wherever I can grab things a little bit easier, I'll do the coat there and then I'll light cure it for about a minute and a half in the light curing unit that's got uh, 365 to 305, uh, 365 to 405 nanometers wavelength. And then you can see I'm applying stuff to the facial. I'm not glazing the teeth. I'm glazing right at the dental enamel junction, dentum enamel junction, sorry. Um, just so I don't have any issues with leakage all the way around. And you can see like at certain spots, like I can't grab things anymore. I'll just put in that little curing table and I'll cure everything. Once everything is cured, I'll use a high shine polishing compound which in this case I'm using palette polish with um, uh, with goat hair brush and just a little buff. And here you can see, if you look closely, you can see that uh, all the acrylic teeth on the upper one are placed, but this denture is not finished yet. This is kind of a pre-finished stage after processing. But I've lined things up and everything's ready to go for those zirconia crowns that are on the bottom to get cemented. Once everything's cemented there, I will go through the same protocols of polishing, getting things prepared, and also getting things sealed. Except with zirconia, uh, I will be using a uh, MDP primer uh, just to uh, bond things a little bit better to the metal with when I'm utilizing my uh, composite cement. And then I will also use uh, the same primer um, on uh, on the glazing portion of things. So the glaze does not stick well to zirconia. Okay, It sticks okay, not amazingly, but it sticks pretty well to ceramic. And the zirconia has a ceramic glaze. So once it's cemented and once it'll seal up the gaps with usually with acrylic, I'll polish things up and I'll sandblast acrylic like I did with the other denture. And uh, I do not put any kind of primer on my acrylic because optic glaze doesn't like primer on acrylic. Uh, it will uh, actually ruin the glaze. But if you're using a ceramic primer, it works fairly well. Even if you want to use it on your composite, because composites are ceramic filled. So if you want to do that, that works okay. But on acrylic, you don't want to put any kind of primer. So once everything's primed that needs to be primed, I will do my glaze and I'll cure that and I'll polish it. Because glaze is virtually composite as well. And polishing it gets rid of all these little imperfections and allows you to get a nice smooth surface. Because you don't want that plaque biofilm adherence. You want to get as much hygiene as possible out of this case. So once that is done, once everything is sealed, you get something like this. So this is an actual case. So you guys are working on this case, but it's an actual patient case. And I just kind of documented the process of me processing this um, start to finish uh, on uh, on the actual protocol and um, I like the fact that it's an actual case because I can show you the shortcomings that were associated with this case I can show you that some things are good some things are not great with the lower everything was perfect we have plenty of room we had plenty of bone reduction we have everything in space on the upper however even though we did everything in our power to make sure everything is done right some mistakes were made and it needed to be corrected. The important thing is not to start pointing blame on things. The important thing to remember that you're working as part of a team. And if things are not going well, you as part of that team are trying to make sure things are going to work out for the best. That's what I try to do. And hopefully you guys will do the same. So we showed you how to go start to finish. From planning to execution to finishing. Um, once this case is done, what I highly recommend is two things. Thing number one 
make sure you scan this case in. If you don't have a scanner, have somebody else scan it for you or create some kind of duplicate of this case because these teeth are going to wear out eventually. Maybe not the zirconia ones, but the ones opposing the zirconia will for sure. And you will need to rethread this case a couple years down the line, maybe five years, maybe sooner. It will be a lot easier to do things if you have a duplicate of the initial position of the occlusion. You can just cross mount things, strip the bars off the old teeth and acrylic or composite, whatever you're using, reset teeth because you remember which, hopefully you have this written down, which mold you were using. So quickly reset things, process it, and you're good to go. That's thing number one. Thing number two, create some kind of occlusal guard. Usually a vacuum form night guard is a good idea. These are not going to be the type of dentures that are going to be coming out. They're staying inside the patient's mouth. So you want to make sure you protect the patient and you want to protect your work. So create a night guard, a soft night guard the patient can wear at night, just so they're not grinding, they're not bruxing. Even though research shows that maybe with so soft night guards, you're going to be increasing the chance of bruxism and grinding. However, I think it's still a good idea to uh, protect your work and protect your patient. Once those things are done, hopefully the case gets placed into orally. You want to equilibrate your bite. Make sure you bring the patient back about two weeks down the line because the bites will even out and adjust the bite further. Make sure they're balancing and protrusive and excursive moments. I think that's about it. If you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask and good luck.